Spiritual Chuck here. Uh, this is a night video. This is going to be a lengthier video. I realize that I have to do my talks at night because it takes too long to upload the videos during the day. So, this is a really interesting realization that I've had uh, about Asparsa Yoga and uh, also about Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is the yoga of the heart. It's the fourth chakra. It's uh, it's about the about love. And Asparsa Yoga is the last yoga. They call it the yoga that all the yogis are afraid of, because it's a complete dissemination of one's egoic identity. It's uh, they call it the way of fire. Uh, without structure or support and uh, it's kind of an obscure uh, yoga and it's really a yoga that has been um, underrepresented uh, in terms of enlightenment possibilities but all of the gurus that I've studied essentially have experienced this particular yoga by going and doing nothing and um, that would include uh, uh, Ramana Maharshi. Uh, the guru that taught this yoga was uh, uh, was a, a man named Gaudapada, and uh, he he wrote about it in the Mandukya Karika, K I K I K R I K A Karika, the no, Mandukya. M-A-N-D-U-K-Y-A. -A. And uh, commentaries uh, by Shankara on this yoga. And I learned about this yoga from a gentleman named Colin Cole, who did his thesis on Asparsa Yoga at the University of British Columbia. And he wrote a book about it. And a fantastic book. Uh, just helped me realize what happened to me 18 years ago in a storage unit at the end of a depression at the end of studying uh, a guru named uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche who was a Tibetan Buddhist monk who was a real off the chain monk he uh, he did whatever he wanted to do and uh, in terms of the worldly his worldly affairs which was really interesting and I kind of pondered that for a while thinking, well, was this guy really as enlightened as people thought he was? And I'm going to kind of substantiate that in this talk. Um, Trungpa was known to, uh, he drank, and uh, he drove car, fast cars, and actually wrecked a car and almost killed himself in the car. And he liked girls, he chased some girls. And, uh, and just prior to me having my a Sparsha Yoga experience and winding up in a steel storage unit in Houston, Texas, which turned out to be a Faraday cage, which blocked all the RF radiation so that I really got an opportunity to be extremely still for four days in the dark in a steel storage unit. And I'm going to tell you about that experience. But to go back to Trungpa, um, he, I had read two or three of his books prior to me winding up in the storage unit. And he was talking about skandhas. And uh, in Tibetan language, skandhas mean our, our egoic karma or our, uh, our egoic manifestations. You know, all the different things that we, that we you know, have that are of, of the egoic nature. And uh, I can't remember them all right off the bat, but they're all, there's five of them, essentially. And uh, they just show up in terms of our ego in all kinds of different ways. And he basically destroyed me. Reali I, he helped me realize the futility of all of my efforts on an egoic level. Uh, and... Uh, that was prior to the storage unit and then I also went and got electroshock acupuncture from a real Chinese acupuncturist and I told him I needed a 
strong dose because I was really hooked on the cigarettes. And so he wound up giving me a really strong treatment and it woke my kundalini up so bad that uh, it just immobilized me. It just, I was just walking around just like with a lightning bolt, you know, up my back. Extremely painful. And I was like, quit my job and sold my stuff. And I mean, I just was done. And uh, that kind of started with trunk paw. And then at the end, it was the acupuncture. And so I was immobilized. I, I just couldn't do anything. And I got so bad that I just wound up going over to the storage unit. And there was a burn-up RV in there that I had traded for some of my stuff. But it never did get going. I wound up selling it, giving it to somebody, whatever. I don't even remember. But I wound up inside that storage unit, inside that burn-up RV for four days, four or five days. Or excuse me, three or four days. Probably four days. I don't even remember because I, I just was so out of it. And I would wake up. And I, and I just went to sleep, you know. And I'd wake up and I'd be like a baby in a shopping cart is the best example I can give. You know, just staring in the space in the dark. I didn't turn a light on one time the whole time I was in there. And so it really gave me an opportunity to kind of light up my, my pineal gland if that... But it was darkened anyway because I knew nothing about water from above. I knew nothing about really decalcifying my pineal gland. I didn't know anything. I mean, I, I did very, very little about what I know today about spirituality and waking up and things like that. And so anyway, I woke up and I just sat there, you know, in pure consciousness. And... uh peaceful you know and then my mind would start going and or my body would start saying hey man you know you're a loser what are you doing in here da 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 da, da. you quit your job and I would say F you but I what I found out later was I was really saying netty netty which is what they say in the east which is you know you're responding to your mind's request by saying Netty netty, which means not this and not this. And then I would lay back down again. And I'd sleep for, you know, I don't know how long. And I'd wake up and I'd be peaceful again. And then I'd sit there for a while. And then here comes my mind again, you know, talking to me about this and that. And maybe even my body, you know, urging me to do something else. And uh, I just netty netty. And I continued to do this uh, for like three or four days because I just was, I'd get to thinking and it would be like, you know, clinical depression, you know. Just terrible thoughts, you know, just things that just, you know, what a loser I was, you know. And I'd take a drink of water and I'd take a pee and I'd lay back down again. And continue to do this and continue to do it. It's like I kept looping. And I, because it was such a peaceful environment, you know, there was no radiation. My cells weren't being orchestrated by 3,000 or 300 million frequencies per second, 5G or 4G or 3G. Uh, I had a real peaceful experience. And it was so peaceful that uh, it was beyond description. It was a peace that surpassed all understanding. And it was so peaceful that it actually wound up staying with me after I got out of the storage unit. It was like it, that peace it burned into me. You know, it's like I just really realized the oneness and the peace and the it produced a fearlessness, and uh, it didn't go away. And I mean, it really didn't go away. And this is 18 years later, and I attribute that peace and that 
fearlessness to my ability to be on this journey that I'm on and to allow myself to walk down the road you know in what would be utter chaos and I've had thoughts that you know I'm a loser what am I doing I'm walking down the highway in case anybody doesn't know I'm walking down the highway with everything I own because I essentially let go of my old life like I did in the storage unit and I happen to be going through what would classically be defined as the dark night of the soul which is normally defined as between 27 and 30 and 57 and 60 and 60 would be a full cycle in the Chinese astrology so this coming year is going to be I'm gonna be 60 and so I've gone a full cycle uh, which you know may or may not mean anything to anybody but uh, it's pretty interesting because everything in my life has been kind of balanced out it's, you know Jesus said the soothsayers and the astrologers won't save you but he didn't say that they were wrong in identifying our spots and astrology has identified my spots in so many ways and one of them is to be a Libra in three different planets Sun Moon and I even forget the the other planet that I'm a Libra in but everything has been like that in my life it's like everything is been balanced you know and the first and the last kind of thing it's like I begin something and I end it the same way I begin it kind of thing so that's what happened uh, in the storage unit or that's what's happening to me now is that I feel like I'm coming in and through this full cycle Buddha had 60 disciples where Christ had 12 and the reason Buddha had 60 is because he had 12 animal signs uh, multiplied by five elements so I happen to be uh, Buddha's 40th disciple rabbit coming out of the forest and uh, four is a very interesting number uh, but anyway 2023 is the year of the water rabbit and that's what I am a water rabbit and so I've always kind of been kind of wishy-washy and the Libra is kind of back and forth. All of this has attributed to my ability to have this depth of experience because of my, you know, I don't know, my nature. It's a scared little rabbit and at the same time wishy-washy and at the same time very sensitive. And so, and intuitive, you know, so, uh, anyway, um, having said all of that, we'll get back to the storage unit, and uh, it was on the fourth day, and I'm not a very visual person, I'm not a very psychic person, I've never been able to, you know, really mem remember my dreams effectively, and, uh, you know, couldn't access the Akashic records or the ethereal realm or any of that. You know, couldn't see angels, couldn't see any of that. Pretty analytical and, and, and logical in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, typical Western American man, you know, this, and it didn't know anything about the waters from above and decalcifying, you know, none of that. But on the fourth day, I had an experience that blew my mind. And I mentioned it, and I've, I've been kind of wondering why and, and how I can contribute or how I can attribute this experience to a full enlightenment experience. Because it's a, it's a form experience. It's not a formless experience like Asparsa Yoga is known to be but anyway on the fourth day I woke up at the end of a dream and the dream was extremely lucid I was fully awake and I realized these four or five masters up in the dark and I couldn't see them they were in the dark 
but they were there, right? I couldn't, I didn't see what they looked like, but they were there. And it, that blew me away because I'm not that kind of, you know, I haven't had those kinds of experiences traditionally. And, and they didn't say anything to me. They telepathied me. And they said in my mind, just as clear as a bell, they said, do not worship us. We are just like you are. We're just not you. And I've mentioned this before in videos about Asparsa. I want to explain it this time. And I went back to sleep. And the next day, or it, it turned out that it was the day, the daytime. I could see a little bit of light, like through the, the walls, you know, uh, or whatever. But it was really dark. So, but I realized it was daytime and, and I got up. And my depression was gone, and my fear was gone, and my suffering was gone, and the kundalini had subsided. And I got out of the storage unit, although there was still damage from the kundalini, it's like I fried my nervous system. So I continued to have cold sweats for like six months, or a year, or more. It was really more than that. It was for years, actually. I had cold sweats at night, but they finally subsided. Um, anyway, I woke up, I got up, and I opened the door, I, the sliding door to the storage unit, and I looked outside and looked up at this beautiful blue sky with cloud, white fluffy clouds in Houston, Texas. And what I saw blew my mind. I saw waves of silver alternating light and dark silver and they were they were all the way up the sky and 360 degrees around and the whole sky was full of these waves and i really you know i today to this day i attribute those waves to either to the wi-fi or to the ethereal realm, the Akashic, uh, the uh, Akashic records, the uh, the heavens, you know. And uh, I I attribute these waves to the mother, to the uh, to the pleroma or the. And I've given definitions of what I feel like that this this experience is in terms of the shape and I'll give you the example again if you can imagine the uh, galaxy not the universe but the galaxy and say okay it's, it's a circular galaxy and then there's a shaft going through the middle of each galaxy and you can sometimes see the light of that shaft and sometimes it's dark and all you seem to see is the wheel of the galaxy. But then I understand that to be the shape, but I also understand that there's an invisible apple-shaped pleroma of energy that makes up that galaxy. And that that shaft is going right through the middle of that apple. And so we're actually only seeing the physical realm and that would be the wheel and whatever amount of particles that are circling around that shaft and we don't see the invisible uh, ethereal realm of a galaxy necessarily so I call a galaxy or that that circular uh, part of it the mother and I call the shaft through the middle the father. And sometimes he's unknowable. He's not visible. He's not, uh, you know what I mean? And so that's my analogy, folks, of, of really this world. I feel like that this world could very well be the shape of the galaxy also. And so I attribute the mother to the galactic 
or the cosmic uh, reality. And I attribute the Father to the uh, universal uh, aspect of of uh, of reality, and and that maybe these shafts that are going through these these galaxies are really maybe they're connected universally to each other, or they go off into space and. I worked at NASA for a couple of years and the engineers wouldn't look me in the eye and I'm in the room or the building where we're in the building where they take all the pictures and they freaked out when we were in there. Like, what are you doing in here? And we're like, we got to pass, you know, we got to pass. We got a security clearance to be in here. So they're freaking out over that, right? It's like, because why? Because maybe they're not telling the whole truth. Why are they not looking me in the eye when I'm walking down the hallway? Because maybe they're not telling the whole truth. <clears throat> so there's a lot of reasons why I think the way that I do about some things. And I'm trying to explain that in this nighttime video so that I can do a quick download. I'm already 21 minutes into this. If you're even still listening. Okay, but... There's a major point I want to make, and I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you what it is now. Asparsa yoga is the way of fire. It's the way of non-contact. Okay, but bhakti yoga is the way of love. It's the way of the heart. It's the way of the fourth chakra. It's the center chakra of our of our seven or nine chakra. Okay, chakra. And uh, interesting thing about that chakra is that if you look at the cross and you envision that Christ had 12 disciples, you could take five points on the cross, on the, on the, on the horizontal part of the cross, and then the vertical part of the cross, you can put seven points, okay? You go, okay, 7 plus 5 is 12, right? But the interesting thing about the cross is if you take those points and you add them all up, if you count them uh, as either vertical or horizontal, uh, you'll get 5 and you'll get 7. And you can say, okay, that's 12. But if you actually count them in the cross... You get 13. Uh, or you add them up as five. Uh, excuse me. You add them up as. Yeah. And and Christ was, was considered the 13th disciple. Or the 13th. In, uh, in addition to the 12th. Uh, so he's missing but he's there. He's, he's, he's known but he's not known. He can be added up, but he's indivisible. Or, I mean, he's, he's infinite. He's beyond counting. If I explain that correctly, uh, hopefully I did. Anyway, um, what I'm trying to say is, is that that heart chakra was the part that I didn't understand. After the storage unit... I spent about six months and had no desire for any of the old habits or any of the old karmas. I was really burnt clean. I didn't, I stopped smoking, didn't even want to smoke, didn't even think about smoking. And I had been completely addicted to smoking and I went back to it about six months afterwards because I didn't know what else to do. It's almost as if I was, in a way I was bored because I didn't know what to do with the, the, the fantastic experience that I'd had. And I didn't know how to realize it in the world. So I just kind of went back to my old ways uh, through familiarity and through not knowing what, what else to do, you know. And so that's how I understand it today. The reason that I didn't understand what else to do was because I didn't really know about the importance of bhakti yoga and about wherever two are joined, there he is. 
and about love and about um, um, the importance of what I'm experiencing in this journey. And I'll tell you what it is, is that I can wake up in the middle of the forest by myself, uh, you know, on a cold morning and this and this, and I can be quite peaceful and I can be quite amazed but if I don't get participation in the world and in my fellow man and in love, then there's really no point in it. In other words, it's like without the, you know, you can have this peace that surpasses all understanding. But if you don't have um, the fruition or the participation of the mother, you see, I call a sparse of the father, I call uh, bhakti the mother. You know, it's wherever two are joined. We come from the mother, right? There's two of us in the mother. When we're, we're conceived, it's the mother and the, and the son. And so, anyway, my understanding today is, is that Along this journey, it's really forcing me to participate in the two, in the people. You know, because I, I'm, I'm dependent on the people, you know, uh, to buy some distilled water and, you know, just keep myself going uh, in the material world. And in order to do that, I need money. And so I talk to people and I tell them what I'm doing. And I tell them it's all on donations. And they donate me some money. And then I go and buy some, you know, whatever it is that I need. And it allows me to continue on this path. Right? And it's become a divine path. And without being forced to continue down this path, I would not realize this, the, the plasma consciousness or the synchronicities or the miracles to have happened over and over and over. Unbelievable. You know, I think about something and then it manifests. <clears throat> I literally, you know, I'm walking down the highway and I had thought earlier that day about needing a lighter. And at some point, I just decided to cross the road, the whole freeway, four-lane highway. I just immediately turn across the road. And then when I get to the other side, immediately look down, and there's a lighter. You know, that's just an example. There's more examples in my, in my videos. So this participation in the mother, you know, is, is the bhakti yoga. It is the love. It is wherever two are joined. And that explains the value of the father and his stillness and his fearlessness and his courage and that he represents incomprehensible, um, no thingness, pure consciousness that manifests into finite consciousness or the mother. So we go through the Father to get to the Blessed Mother and all of her divinity and all of her miracles and her synchronicities and her angels and her, you know, the guys that I saw in the storage unit and the waves and the, and the pleroma and the multiplicity and the many. So I go from the one to the many. Or as Plato said, God was one, one, or one good. You know? So it's that combination of the father and the mother that produces the son. The miracle of the son, the, the light of the world. And that's what I feel like I've become. As we all have. We all are. And it was... I think in the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
They said, Jesus said, what I am, you are. What I can do, you can do. And some of you may surpass me in your works. And a lot of people don't know how to take that statement. They don't understand how they could possibly be like Christ. And you can be like Christ by knowing the Father in the stillness and also rejoicing in the Mother. Now I want to mention one of the modern day gurus and his name is Heideken Babaji. And he's a really incredible guru. One of the, uh, his accomplishments was at 18 years old, he sat in a temple for 45 days without moving from his position. 45 days, folks. It's like, what? Now, you want to talk about being still with the Father? This guy knew the Father. And the miracles of his presence have been reiterated by so many of his followers that they literally saw the light shining, beaming out of him. Incredible. Um, one of the most famous people that followed him was uh, Steve Jobs, you know, who started Apple. And anyway, if that means anything to anybody, uh, another interesting aspect of, of Heideken Baba G was that he would sit around and uh, experience love with all the people. That's all he did. He sat around and he loved the children and the women and the men and the fellowship. And he was very social and uh, very active with the people actively loving them you know what I'm saying and interestingly enough he was born in 1970 which is the loyal year of the dog which also happens to be the year that the book was written by J.W. Armstrong called The Water of Life a treatise on urine therapy urine therapy happens to be talking about uh, ultra filtered plasma Plasma happens to be known in the East as cosmic consciousness um, and also comes from the mother because ultra-filtered plasma is amniotic fluid and we were grown in it. We were grown in the light and we have an everlasting flowing uh, fountain of life flowing through us uh, with our pee, with our ultra-filtered plasma. And one of the things Heideken Baba G said was, he said, he said, don't get too close to me and don't stay too far away. And that's the interesting thing about ultra-filtered plasma or urine therapy is that you don't stay in it too close and you don't stay too far away from it. And that's one of the ways that I've been able to stay healthy throughout my journey is that I don't drink all of my water. I don't loop all of my water. I loop what I need to loop and I age what I need to age and I anoint myself uh, uh, when I need to anoint myself, which I don't do enough of. I, I admit that I don't stay in the waters enough but it's real interesting that he would say that. And then it's also, um, there's some other fascinating things I was going to say about urine therapy. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> they're in my videos. Um, we're already 34 minutes into this, which is incredibly long, except that it will upload pretty fast because I don't have any uh, visuals. Hang on a second. Oh yeah, back to Heideken Baba G. One of the other fascinating things about him was he didn't live that long. And he talked about his body being just a vessel and that, that 
it would it would fall away but that his his spirit his light would still be a presence and people to this day go to his ashram in India and feel his presence the other beautifully wonderful thing about his life is that he was practicing bhakti yoga after having experienced the father or a sparsa yoga and he actually his heart stopped in 1984 on february the 14th do we know what that day is that day is valentine's day you know and if there was ever a celebration of the heart and of bhakti yoga it would certainly be on valentine's day wouldn't you think and uh so he was born on the year that that jw armstrong wrote his book about urine therapy and baba g uh is is supposed to be a manifestation of of uh shiva you know and shiva is supposed to be a manifestation of um Um, plasma plasma is considered the fourth state of matter and Jesus said in the Nagamati in Aramic he was in a scene and in the Dead Sea Scrolls he said that um, hang on a second one of the things Jesus said was he said Eat what they offer and then tell them the truth. And so my suspicion is, is that the Essenes have practiced urine therapy. Because if you practice urine therapy, you can eat pretty much anything. And it's going to come out like, you know, it's going to clean. You're still going to be cleansed. You're going to be fully cleansed and you're going to stay healthy. And the Essenes uh, lived to be 120 years old, and they practiced uh, they practiced uh, you know vegetarianism, and uh, I have a suspicion that they practiced shivambu or urine therapy, a real strong suspicion, and that this was one of the secrets, or one of the biggest secrets that they had that the powers that be in Rome didn't want them to have and did not want to propagate. So I'm back to the, one of the biggest secrets in the world. You know, the light of, of Shiva, the light of Shivambu. Shivambu is urine therapy. So I'm putting all the pieces together for you in this video as fast as I can. You may want to listen to this again, <clears throat> and uh, you may want to practice it and stay in the waters from above, the, the, the distilled water. If you think about Jesus having been anointed or being had, having been baptized by John in the water, and you think about rainwater, rainwater or distilled water cleanses the body of all inorganic matter and prepares you to receive uh, your water or the shivambu, the urine therapy, because once you go through the distilled water or rain water, then your water tastes like honey water. Okay? And it's pure and it's full of light. And then you can go through that water and have a further awakening into the mother, into the love, into the bhakti yoga. You see, so the father could represent the distilled water or the rain water. And the mother could represent your water. And those are the two together. And so 18 years ago, I didn't realize the importance. I'd, I'd found the father, but I hadn't known the mother. And now I know them both. And now I know the Son. And He's in me. I'm the light of the world, just as He is. 
just as you are. What I am, you are. What I can do, you can do. And some of you may surpass me in your works. And I said that at 40 minutes. And I'm the Buddha's 40th disciple. No mistakes, Mother. She's so divine. I call it plasma consciousness. I call synchronicities plasma consciousness. It's amazing. It's one miracle after another, after another, after another. From the mother. Due to the father. You know. So. That's it guys. This is, you know. I don't know if uh, all my listeners are want to listen to this, but. Uh, some, of, some of the younger listeners may, may not want to, but. It's a long video. It's kind of hard to understand. So, anyway, thank you all so much. I love you with all my heart. Peace, love, and light. And don't be afraid of the dark.